Today's episode is for Elena. Elena, huge shout out to you. Elena is the daughter of an agent that I coach, and his name is Henry. Henry and I were talking uh, just yesterday in a coaching session, and he was telling me that him and his daughter listen and watch the show every morning on her way to school. So Elena, huge shout out to you. This episode is for you. So today we're going to talk about the number one threat that faces part-time real estate agents. And then we're going to get into whether or not the real estate industry should be celebrating AI or if it's something we should actually fear. And then we'll talk about how Wall Street got it wrong when it comes to the housing market in 2023. So before we jump into today's episode, if you're a real estate agent watching or listening to the show and you want to build a listing-based business, you're interested in generating a multiple six-figure income every year for the rest of your career without having to sacrifice nights and weekends away from your family, I'm going to put a link in the show notes for you to find out more information about my Listing Agent Academy coaching program. You can get all the details and then determine if working together with me at this time makes sense or not. So with that said, let's jump into today's episode. All right, so let's explore the part-time real estate agent. There, that comes with a lot of different challenges. And I coach a lot of part-time real estate agents. I made a lot of content about how to succeed as a part-time real estate agent. But there's something that I believe that is the number one challenge or the number one threat for most real estate agents. And social psychologists call this the 100% rule. And we're going to get into great details about what this is and how this applies to real estate agents that are part-time, that maybe have a full-time job. And I'm hoping that through this conversation comes clarity for people that I think struggle with the decision as to, should I go full-time in real estate? Should I continue to be part-time? If I do go full-time, when should I do that? When's the right time? What should I have in place? These are all the questions that I get often from part-time real estate agents. And before I think any of those questions can be answered, to be fair, we have to really explore what we're going to talk about in this video. So social psychologists, they, they did a study. And the study that they did was on successful entrepreneurs versus those people that wanted to be an entrepreneur but they haven't yet started. It was the idea of starting a business. And when I started to really dig deep and understand all that went into this, I said, wow, that is exactly what people are dealing with every day when they're thinking about in terms of being part-time in real estate and this whole idea of going full-time. And so I'm going to start this conversation off by a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. He said, a mind stretched by new experience can never go back to its former dimensions. And so in this study, and I'm going to show you a video here in just a second from Dr. Benjamin Hardy, who talks about this in, in great detail. But in the study, they talked a lot about this idea of the point of no return. That in the study, those entrepreneurs that went off to start businesses to succeed in those businesses versus those that didn't really got themselves into this point of no return. And as defined by the psychologists, here's some things that they talked about. Number one, and this is so critical, was those that succeeded in business made a financial investment into their future self. This was the beginning of the point of no return. And when I thought about that, what happened was a lot of these entrepreneurs would, as an, the example they gave, one entrepreneur made the investment into a, a pallet of shoes because this entrepreneur was going to build a shoe store online, sell these shoes online. And before he was ready, he invested the money into the product. And so he had no choice 
that pallet showed up at his house with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes that at that moment, he was at a point of no return. And so I think about how does this relate to part-time real estate agents? How can we apply this if you are a part-time real estate agent? Well, making an investment into your future self could look like a couple of things. I've talked about this in a lot of different videos. One is that you're certainly investing in your education, getting your licenses, whatever certifications you, you, you may deem necessary. Maybe you invest in a coaching program up front. We have had many part-time real estate agents with the goal of going full-time invest in our coaching program, the Listing Agent Academy, to set themselves up to prepare themselves to go full-time. The other thing I think about when I talk about making the financial investment into your future self is setting up the, the savings in a way that allows you to potentially leave your full-time employment to get into real estate full-time. And making that investment, and in other words, are you saving enough money to go full-time in real estate? And in, in many cases, I recommend that that be six months of savings. And not just savings, but six months worth of what you make today and six months worth of bills or expenses. And you're generating the income from your part-time real estate sales and we're investing that money into this six-month nest egg so that you can save or invest in your future self. And that future self, for most people that want to become a full-time real estate agent. When this happened, the psychologists determined when people went through this point of no return, they made the financial investment into their future self, that alone shifted their identity. That when they went all in with a financial investment and the money was spent, that th at that very moment, their identity shifted and their behavior started to align with the new identity. Whereas before, the person who had maybe had the full-time job who didn't make the financial investment with the entrepreneurs that didn't succeed, their identity never shifted. And therefore, as a result, their behavior didn't change. They step, they, they, they continue to behave like their current or old self. And those that said, I'm going to commit to this investment into my future self, then their behavior aligned with that new identity. And there's something that Dr. Benjamin Hardy talks about. I'm going to play this video for you guys in just a second. And this whole idea, and this is thus why I'm making this video, which is 100% commitment is easier for humans than 98% commitment. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Take a listen to Dr. Benjamin Hardy. But that idea is also actually backed by a lot of very interesting science and psychology. So again, the quote is 100% is easier than 98%. And the reason why this is so important is because if you're only 98% committed to something, what that means is that you're not actually truly committed. You're not actually fully there. You haven't actually made the decision. And if you haven't made a decision about something, what that means is that you're not actually sure what you're gonna do. If Elko was only 98% committed, and he was in an environment where his favorite dessert was served, then he would have to play a tug of war in his mind about what he was gonna do. Do I eat it this time? Do I not eat it? And that right there, that mental tug of war, is called decision fatigue. Basically, the idea of decision fatigue is, it's another word for willpower, but it means you haven't yet made a choice, and you're not actually sure what you're gonna do, and because you're not sure what you're gonna do, often the situation wins. That's one of the most consistent things that's found in social psychology, is that generally people are the byproduct of their situation. And the reason for that is, is because people are not decided. Michael Jordan actually had a very powerful quote. Michael Jordan said, once I made a decision, I never thought about it again. And uh, kind of the Latin root of the word decision means that once you make a decision, you have to actually cut off alternative options. And so because Elko made a 100% commitment rather than a 98% commitment, 
And he also shifted his identity by asking himself, can I not, not, he didn't ask himself the question, could I do this for the next 30 days? Because if you think about it, if you want to do something for 30 days, then you definitely haven't changed how you see yourself. You're basically saying, I think I can do this for about 30 days, but then once that 30 days is over, or that year is over, I'm going to go right back to doing what I was. But maybe then I'll have a little bit more control. That's not what happened to Tom Hartman. That's not what happened to Elko. And as a result, those two people, they made a, a fundamental, a permanent shift. So those are just some of the entrepreneurs that he was talking about in, in some of this research. And I found it very interesting when he talks about anything less than 100% is actually harder for human beings because of decision fatigue. And we've all heard it before, the whole latent meaning for decision is to cut off. And if you haven't made a decision, then you find yourself in this decision fatigue or what Dr. Benjamin Hardy calls the mental tug of war versus actually making the decision. Social psychologists have determined that we have about 50,000 thoughts a day. And for a lot of part-time real estate agents, they can't stop thinking about, should I go full-time? Should I not? This is super scary. What's at risk? What are the pros? What are the cons? What does the timing look like? Should I try to time the market? What about this? What about health insurance? And they're constantly in this decision fatigue that, that Dr. Hardy talks about. And in oftentimes what occurs is resentment, is that that person starts to resent their current situation, causing even more frustration. They start to resent their job, that this job is keeping me back. And they start to think about all the things of, or all the potential what, what ifs or, or, or what could be if I could just quit this job. What could be if I went full time? And the fact that they haven't made the decision, in other words, they haven't gone 100% in all the way, they haven't burned the, the boats, that that resentment starts to increase even more. They start to be more frustrated at work. And then what potentially happens is they put themselves in a very vulnerable situation. And that is being forced to make a decision because maybe or perhaps the lack of performance at the full-time job is in jeopardy. And now that job is saying, hey, dude, you're either in or you're out, or that person gets fired, or that person gets laid off, or that person gets reprimanded at work. And now they're risking that full-time income because of lack of decision. And so the successful entrepreneurs in the study they went all in. They made the decision, and as a result, they cut off anything before it. When that happened, they shifted their identity, which allowed them to act on the new identity versus being having one foot in and one foot out. And I see this with part-time real estate agents all the time, that the fact that they're half in, half out, but wanting full-time results causes massive frustration. Little or half commitment can only produce results that are maybe half as good. And so for a lot of people that want to get into real estate full time, if they're making an income part time, that maybe is what they're earning in their full time income, they start to think about, okay, what if I was full time? What is possible? So let's get into AI. Everywhere you look, it's on every headline. Everyone's talking about chat, GBT, and, and, and artificial intelligence. And my question, as I start to think about this, and there's all kinds of things I'm going to share with you in, in this video that have to do with the question that I've been thinking about as it relates to the real estate industry. And that is, is open AI in all these different AI platforms. Is this something that we should be promoting? Is this something we should be excited about? Or should we approach this with a little bit of caution or a little bit of reservation? Is it something that we should be concerned about, that we should actually fear? And I bring this to your awareness, and really this is what I've been thinking about lately, 
because Elon Musk has been on a bunch of different interviews lately, and he has been talking a lot about his concerns with chat GPT and open AI. And if you didn't know, I mean, Elon Musk was the one responsible for open AI because of the way AI was going and he wasn't happy with how Google and and the owners of Google, how they were handling this. And so Elon Musk took it upon himself to say, well, I want to have this open AI, this nonprofit, which then became chat GPT. And I want you to listen to some of the concerns that Elon Musk has about AI. And then we'll get into maybe some of the concerns in the real estate industry. We're rapidly headed towards digital superintelligence that far exceeds any human. I think it's very obvious. ChatGPT, I think, has illustrated to people just how advanced AI has become. And there are much more advanced versions for that that are coming out. I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Because if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike digital superintelligence, they can take over the world. Mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. At least when there's an evil dictator, that fewer is going to die. But for an AI, there would be no death. It would live forever. I and mean, you'd have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. You know, it's quite dangerous technology. And I, I fear I may have done some things to accelerate it. You know, I, I played a significant role in the creation of uh, OpenAI. Um, essentially, at the time, I was concerned that Google uh, was not uh, paying enough attention to AI safety. And so I, I, I created OpenAI. And although initially it was created as an open source nonprofit, now it is closed source and for profit. So pretty, you know, for me, hearing Elon Musk talk about his concerns with this, the, the, the guy who really knows more about AI probably than anybody else on the planet, and, and hearing him share his concerns really got me thinking, you know, and I see all kinds of reports and headlines coming out in, in real estate about how, you know, people are excited about AI and all these, you know, upsides. But recently, there was a report that came out that got my attention. And it was the fact that the CFPB and the DOJ warn about AI advances and that they are not an excuse to break laws. I'm going to share some, some insights from, from this report. And then I'm going to share something even more interesting that literally just happened that essentially paused all AI development. And I'll get to that in just a second. So this recent report talks about how a lot of these agencies are, are saying that while emerging AI platforms are not widely regulated, that existing laws must obviously still be followed. And that's the big concern with the CFPB and the DOJ. So the report said representatives of the federal enforcement and regu uh, regulatory agencies, including the CFPB and the Department of Justice, Federal Trade Commission, and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are warning that emergence of AI technology does not give a license to break existing laws pertaining to civil rights, fair competition, consumer protection, and equal opportunity. Potential discrimination outcomes in the CFPB's areas of focus are the chief concern. And this is what the report said, and I quote, technology marked as AI has spread to every corner of the economy. And regulators need to stay ahead of its growth to prevent discrimi uh, disc discrimination outcomes and threaten families' financial stability. Today's joint statement makes it clear that the CFPB will work with its partner enforcement agencies to root out discrimination caused by any tool or system that enables unlawful decision making. These agencies have had all kind uh, have uh, had addressed the rise of AI recently. They're all coming out and talking about this now. Last year, the CFPB published a report confirming that 
consumer protection laws remain in place for its industries regardless of the technology being used to serve the consumer. This is where we're seeing all these platforms, these real estate platforms coming up using AI and the concern with those. And I've got some fears and some concerns that I've been thinking about. I'm going to share with you guys in a second. The report went on to say that the DOJ's Civil Rights Division in January published a statement of interest in federal court explaining that the Fair Housing Act applies to algorithm-based tenant screening services after a lawsuit in Massachusetts alleged that the use of these algorithm-based scoring systems to screen tenants discriminated against Black and Hispanic rental applicants. The FTC published a report in June warning about harms that could come from AI platforms, including inaccurate information, bias, discrimination, and commercial surveillance creep. And here's an example. While machines crunching numbers might seem capable of taking human bias out of the equation, that's not what is happening. Findings from academic studies and news reporting raise serious questions about algorithmic bias. For example, a statistic analysis of two million mortgage applications found that black families were 80% more likely to be denied by the algorithm when compared to white families with similar financial credit backgrounds. And so these protection bureaus or agencies are all over this. And in fact, not, not, it's not just real estate that, that, uh, or consumer protection agencies that are concerned the future of life organization is also concern. It's it's a lot of people finally raising concerns that this thing could get way out of control. And so the future of life, they just released this article that essentially pauses all AI development for six months. Let me share my screen and share with you what it says. All right, so this is right on their website. It says, AI systems with human competitive intelligence can pose profound risks to society and humanity, as shown by extensive research and acknowledged by top AI labs. As stated in a widely endorsed uh, AI principles, advanced IA could represent a profound change in the history of life on Earth and should be planned for and managed with care and resources. Unfortunately, this level of planning and management is not happening. Even though recent months have seen AI labs la uh, locked in in an out of control race to development and deploy even more powerful digital minds that no one, not even the creators can understand, predict or reliably control. And they went on to talk about all the different reasons why all AI development needs to be paused, shut down, reevaluated. And I think that was the smartest thing that could have happened. And that report was released, I think, just a couple of weeks ago. And so this gets my mind thinking about okay, you know, obviously there's a lot of excitement around open AI in, in real estate, but what are the downsides? You know, what are the potential harms? Because people are like, well, what's the big deal? Well, just imagine for a second, okay, because you look at social media. There are so many social media accounts right now that simply are not human beings. And you would not even know it. They're starting, there, there's there's thousands of them, you know, with, on these social media channels every day. They're not human beings. And so imagine the harm that can be done if a bot or some type of AI has a social media account, starts to message people starts to lead someone potentially to believe that we'll just, you know, th these are some of the things I'm thinking about Le leading someone to believe that they're going to be selling their house and they're having a conversation with a potential buyer, getting that buyer to apply for a mortgage, uh, get into some, some financial situations where the whole thing wasn't even real. What about a lot of these AI platforms talk about the potential replacement of real estate humans, you and I, real estate agents, 
in the contract to close process. Well, think about all the harm that could be done there. That an AI platform, you don't know if it's real or not, is emailing somebody, drafting its own addendums to cause massive financial harm in a real estate transaction. These are just some of the things that I think about as, as, as downside unintended consequences of unregulated AI platforms amongst many, 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 many others. You know, this is just the start. And the fact that we just don't know. And, you know, again, I think that this, this report or this pause that came out from the future of life.org is so smart. Because I think that the potential upsides, maybe, maybe we find, and we being the human race, find that they don't outweigh the downside potential threat that is posed by AI. And so I would love to see this thing just slow down, everybody relax, instead of you know rushing into this to potentially find something catastrophic that happens and then there's no turning back. So curious to kind of get your guys' thoughts on, you know, open AI, chat, GPT, the potential risks that maybe you have thought about. I, I understand all the upsides. I mean, I made a video about the cool things that it can do. I get it. But with that, with 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 that, I think comes great responsibility. And I think it's smart to see the world doing what it's doing. So let's talk about a new report that just came out that said, new home sales proving Wall Street was wrong. Wrong about the housing market crash. And you see, I have made a couple videos about this very topic. And when I saw this came out, and there's some really interesting points that I'm going to go through with you guys in just a minute. But I think that, you know, based on all the data coming out now, in all these mass media outlets or, or, or Wall Street, there's a lot of people that were betting on another housing market Armageddon or believing that we're heading into another 2008 when we saw the Great Recession. And that's just simply not, not the case. It's simply not happening. And this report from Housing Wire came out yesterday, and I thought it was really, really good. Let me share some of the things that they talked about, and then we'll, we'll get into it. So here's how it starts off. Why are home builders' stocks up so much? Don't they know that new home sales apocalypse is here? You know, the one that says that we have too much inventory and millions of vacant homes in the U.S.? According to this theory, we have more homes under construction than any time in history. The truth is, it's not 2008 all over again. The lure of housing 2008 story is is very very appealing to a lot of these uh investors a lot of these news outlets however the people who say low inventory is fake news don't realize that housing credit channels are very different from 2008 which has presented or I'm sorry prevented total active listings from looking anything like 2008 certain people on Wall Street like to get ahead of the crowd by by being early. In their haste, they miss the bigger picture of the housing market. There is a boring long-term story here about the total active listings being low in America. And the person who wrote this said, I just don't believe it's a story that Wall Street wanted to discuss. It's very sexy to talk about the gloom and doom about the housing market, which is so true. But sometimes that doesn't end well. Here's the case in point. New home sales came in Tuesday. Made a video about this yesterday. This report is so critical. The fact that new homes and the data that we got yesterday came out. Because the real story is about supply and demand. Okay, so here's what happened. Here, here's some information about the new home sales report that is vitally important to the U.S. housing market right now. This is from the Census Bureau. New home sales and new single-family houses in March 2023 were at a seasonal, seasonally adjusted annual rate of 683,000, according to the estimates released by the U.S. Census Bureau and the Department of Housing and Development. This is nine 
0.6% above the revised February rate. When did all this happen? The forward-looking housing data started to improve in November 9th, 2022, when purchase applications data uh, when purchase applications w- was up and almost everybody ignored it. The thing is, builders have time to work off their backlog of homes because they're efficient sellers. They can cut prices. They can lower mortgage ra- mortgage rates, which is super important. We're going to talk about that in a second. And they can do what they need to sell their product, which is a commodity to them. They don't have the same issues as existing homeowners do because they're not living in the property. So let's talk about that for a second. And then I will talk about new home supply, which was something that Wall Street and a lot of these fear mongers were were hanging their hat on to say this is going to cause a massive housing market crash. We're going to talk about that in a second. But here's the thing with new construction. This is why I talked about in yesterday's episode that new construction potentially opens up a whole new opportunity for this housing market that nobody saw coming. In that, new builders were were going to be offering the incentives that they are for people that can't find what they're looking for, can't afford these high prices with existing home sales, with high mortgage rates. So go to the new home builder, get exactly what you want at a price that you can afford because home builders are offering low interest rates, lower interest rates than you can get otherwise, which is why I think we're seeing home uh, new home sales do what they're doing. And you're seeing a lot of people get into a 5% and even less we saw in a mortgage rate that's less than 5% on a brand new home, whereas if they bought an existing home that they don't love, that doesn't have exactly what they want, at an interest rate at 6.5%. So it's a huge draw for people to go new construction. This is why I said what I said in yesterday's episode, which was that the new construction market or new homes maybe is the hero in this housing market in 2023. Think about all the homeowners that want to sell. They want to downsize. They want to upsize. But the story that we keep hearing, you and I, as real estate agents, where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? I'm at 3.5% of my mortgage. There's nothing out there. Everything is way overpriced, way inflated. And if I get into something, not only do I have to get in something that I don't love, I got to overpay and I've got to get an interest rate at 6.5% when I'm at 3.5% right now. Well, not if you go new construction. You can get exactly what you want and get a rate that is more reasonable. Now, this is the thing that is even more important is when we look at new home supply. So for for sale inventory and months supply, the seasonal adjusted estimate of new houses for sale at the end of March was 432,000. This represents 7.6 months of supply. However, there's a lot of context to housing data. This is what we have to pay attention to. This is what I continue to talk about in these housing market update videos because Wall Street and people making content about the housing market love to manipulate the data and they love to take things out of context to say, well, look at new home Sale inventory, it's 7.6 months. Well, let's talk about supply as it relates to what's good for home builders and what's bad. When supply is six and a half months or above, most of the time, builders pull back on construction. And the headline supply is at 7.6 months worth of supply. That's what the media wants you to believe. Listen. It's right there. The data says what it says. Brandon, you just said it too. Anything over six and a half months, builders pull back on construction. We're at 7.6 months of inventory. Right. Let's break down the 7.6 months of, of supply so that you have the context. And then you start to look behind the curtain and say, ah, I see. Here's the breakdown of the 7.6 months worth of supply. 
267,000 homes are under uh, construction. That's 4.7 months of supply. 94,000 of those homes still need to start construction. They haven't even started. That's 1.7 of the 7.6 months worth of inventory. And oh, get this. 71,000 homes are completed for sale that are actually ready for someone to buy it. Guess how many months of supply that is? Only 1.2 months worth of supply. That's the real saleable inventory with new homes right now is 71,000. Let's give you some context. When we saw the housing bubble or the housing crash, we were close to 200,000 new home that were completed for sale that were for sale. We have 71,000 right now. 1.2 months worth of inventory. Here's what's also true. Anything under three, three uh, months worth of inventory is a highly seller's market. And this is why we see so many people going to new construction. This is why we see the new construction or new home sale sector of the marketplace doing so well. It's not what Wall Street wanted to see. It's not what Wall Street wanted us to believe. It's not what the fear mongers wanted us to believe when they said there's this massive housing market crash coming because of new construction, because there's 7.6 months of inventory. Right. But when you get into it and you start to look at the data, you find, well, geez, there's only about a month worth of inventory. And oh, by the way, builders are doing things for buyers that otherwise these buyers would have no options to do or no ability to do. So it'll be interesting as we continue to get more information on the housing market because we've yet to see, we've yet to have any evidence that supports a massive housing market crash. In that, home prices are going to fall, that they're going to drop dramatically 20, 30, 40% like we saw in 2008.